Good afternoon, everyone. Do you still have energy for one last session? Yeah, one more. One more. <laughs> awesome. I know that you are a bit uh, tired after two days full of uh, awesome uh, talks. At least I am a bit, to be honest. Um, but I'm happy to be here. And I will also make some references of the sessions that uh, have attended in, um, in my slide deck. I will have to start saying that for me is the first time uh, attending uh, Spring.io. Who's attending uh, Spring.io for the first time? Raise your hand. Wow, wow, let's go. Okay, team uh, first timers. That's really nice, really cool. And not only that I'm attending for the first time Spring.io, but I'm also speaking for the first time at uh, Spring.io. And um, I can say it's one of the first times speaking in front of um, yeah, quite a um, large audience and also very experienced as, uh, as uh, you are. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful uh, that you are here and uh, joined to, to listen my story. Let's start then with the topic. I will start with the question, how many of you have heard about ASML or what is ASML doing? Raise your hand. Okay, okay, it's pretty polarized, then that's nice. It also is my job for the next slides. So I have to tell you, I will have uh, the first part about what we are doing in the domain. But let's look at the goals for this talk. So I'll talk about what is SML and how Java is contributing for the high volume manufacturing of chips. Then we'll look on how to handle distributed uh, tracing. Yeah, you saw in the title that I'm talking about the migration to, to Spring Boot 3. And, and then, of course, I would like to share the migration challenges that we have encountered, lesson learned and solutions uh, adopted um, regarding not only distributed tracing, but also HTTP client uh, resiliency, graceful shutdown, API documentation, testing. Um, yeah, Jakarta uh, namespace, I'll also briefly uh, mention it. So then, a bit about uh, myself. Who am I? I'm uh, Laurentiu. I'm a senior software engineer for ASML for over eight years. In reality, I'm a full stack engineer uh, and problem solver, passionate about uh, software in general. In the office, uh, you will see me as uh, in, in this illustration from Martin Fowler that I like it a lot. Um, per programming, most of the time, if not always, or doing uh, team programming. So I'm a people's guy, I'm a core engineer, this is what I uh, like to do. Uh, so maybe I'm not the best uh, speaker, but if uh, you like to pair program with me afterwards or keep in touch, if it would be awesome. I love to do this. And I'm also a bouldering fan. So is any of you uh, a bouldering fan here? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, cool. Then let's uh, talk afterwards. For you, especially, Barcelona is a known region for outdoor rock climbing and also a number of bouldering gyms. So then, yeah, if you have the chance, uh, please try it out. Um, but then, um, let, let me tell you about ASML for those of you that are not aware, how big we are. So at the end of 2023, we had over 40K employees scattered around uh, 60 locations, uh, over 60 locations around the world. So this is to get an idea how many people are involved to, to contribute to the lithography chips manufacturing. And therefore, we have to consider the systems that we build in this very large organization. But then first, I would like to take a step back. So this is probably, for, for some of you, a well-known graph to see how computing power increased over the last century. So yes, it's good to remember this. We started from 1900, and then it increased with an 18 order of magnitude the computing power till nowadays where we can see the yeah, super um, 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 computing power for the graphic cards, for example, that, um, that we use. And in 1965, yeah, probably you are aware, there was a famous observation made by Gordon Moore, which was saying that the number of transistors are doubling in an integrated circuit um, every year. And then he rephrased this famous observation 10 years later, and he said that the number of transistors will double every two years. So what we are doing at ASML, we are keeping the Moore's law alive. And then the big question is, is still uh, Moore's law valid or not? Now, there are polarized views on this. The one that I prefer to refer 
is that it's still valid, but it's not only about the number of transistors. There are multiple elements that are part of the integrated uh, circuit, and also it's about the efficiency of it. Okay, what will be the power of the chip uh, that we make? When I refer to the chip, I'm referring to the CPU, to the RAM, to the NAND for HDD and uh, SSD. To, to have it clear. So then in this picture, we see the exponential uh, progress of the computing power over time. And of course, this is possible with the help of um, ASML. And to make this even more obvious, I would like to zoom in to compare to electronic devices. On the left side, we have a laptop from early 80s, IBM 5150. Is there any one of you who actually had fun with this uh, laptop? Oh, yes, okay, okay, we have uh, someone there, we have Stefan, if I see correctly, uh, there is a bright light in my eyes, but I think it's Stefan, yeah. And if we look at the characteristics of each electronic device, so we see that there is a huge uh, growth. So on the left side, yeah, if we compare the, the processor, compare with the latest uh, smartphone released, then interesting one is the wor working memory. So we went from the 16 KB to AGB RAM. And then if we look also at the internal storage, yeah, you can see there the socket for the floppy disk. Um, it was 160 KB for the IBM. I actually played with the floppy disk in the early 90s, uh, having games uh, on them and passing them from uh, yeah, one friend to, to another. But I think they were 1.4 MB or uh, what was the size of them. But then now we have one terabyte on the latest uh, smartphones. So isn't uh, this impressive? And of course the transistor count so in the latest uh, smartphones released, we have over 19 billion transistors. An analogy that I would like to make, and that's very representative, if we think about the Apollo mission, so this was late 60s, we went there with two computers, having 32 KB RAM and 72 KB read-only memory to go to the moon and back. And now if we look at the characteristics of the last uh, smartphone released, yeah, that's impressive. And again, this happened with the help of ASML in the whole fabrication process of the, of the chips. But then, okay, where is the software uh, playing a role into this? There are two main drivers that we have to consider. One is the yield. Yield represents the percentage of chips that are workable. What does it mean? There is a super complex process for printing um, layers on a silicon structure. And then in the end, we'll get yeah, the CPU, let's say, and has to be workable. Not always has to, it is workable. And then it is quite an impact uh, for the fabrication uh, process. And the second driver is the throughput. So the amount of chips that are produced every hour. So this is what we are trying to improve with our software. But before that, let's have a closer look inside of one of the printing machines that we are doing. So this is with one of the latest technologies. It's called EUV. And of course, we see there in the middle the light source or the laser. Uh, we can see how it travels from the reticle on top to the silicon structure on the bottom. And that is where um, the feature is printed on the silicon structure. And we can consider it a simple um, yeah, one transistors. There are uh, multiple layers every time they have to go through to, to this um, process. On top there, we have the reticle, which has a pattern of a certain resolution. And using this set of mirrors, we have to shrink it by a factor of yeah, um, four times approximately, but then has to be very tiny on the structure in order to accommodate for this high number of uh, transistors. Okay, if you are still with me, um, then let's look in where our platform uh, plays a role. So we have the printing machine, and then we have the measurement machine. So the measurement machine will try to measure for potential errors that happen during uh, printing or um, um, yeah, lithography process, how we call it, and have mentioned earlier about the yield and throughput metrics. Um, which are the main uh, criteria. So for this, we have a platform which is able to interact with the machines in the fab, get the necessary data, and simulate for and provide corrections for the next uh, lithography fabrication process loop. So this is the main driver um, for our platform. Now, uh, what's interesting, we are running in a full air-gapped system. So you can see here a picture or of how it looks 
actually in the in the fab context so we have the hardware and server somewhere in a room completely isolated so there is no connection to outside therefore the production has to be done on prem and then if we look further considering the critical environment described then we cannot afford any impact on the running processes while doing upgrades so then we use the rolling upgrades uh, strategies uh, to make sure there is zero downtime for our um, platform in short of course we want our services to run on the latest tech available but then we carefully have to balance uh, this and then if you look okay what is our platform so we have a highly scalable platform what does it mean depending on the fab context um, an example would be uh, the amount of data that we have to to process then um, okay we have to scale it uh, appropriately and then uh, has to be highly available zero downtime uh, resilient um, and of course uh, um, rolling upgrades, what I mentioned, uh, we'll have to use, has to be secure, no vulnerabilities in the code, and then um, access control and secure uh, data transfer has to be ensured. And it is designed, what I've mentioned, for large volumes of data and for computing intensive um, applications, for handling computations of intensive applications. It's based on open and de facto standards. And if we look uh, next, these are the technologies yeah not all but most of the technologies that we are using so I, we are trying to rely on the open uh, standards and trying to rely on cncf um, projects as much as possible so then if we look at uh, the deployment we'll have one deployment which has a high number of services containerized services interconnected and the magnitude is um, yeah uh, the level of hundreds of uh, services we are dealing with and of course a good percentage of them are developed using java and then here is where we started our, our uh, migration uh, uh, journey yeah we started with the baseline of java 8 and spring boot uh, 2.2 so on this slide i will uh, stay a bit and i would like to mention that we did all the intermediate steps until the version of java 8 plus spring boot uh, 2.7 that was nice then we did the migration to java 17 um, of course um, here we uh, used open rewrite to give us an indication of which are the changes but it was a very long journey it will require a separate talk for this uh, talk i will focus on the second part of the story and then um, okay what we got with um, java 17 for us it was the performance improvements and we had the opportunity to um, redo the performance qualification so then we had a closer look at the um, footprint um, of our um, containers and um, we leverage the default garbage collector in java 17 uh, g1 and we use the container awareness functionality which um, meanwhile it's also available for java 8 but uh, at that time yeah um, it was available since java 10 and since we are moving to an lts version then um, we did the intermediate step to 11 and then to to 17 but for this talk i will focus on the second uh, part of the story so then we had the first solution with the uh, uh, spring boot 3 and uh, java 17 we achieved the faster startup time so this was nice and easy win and then in looking to the aot and native part yeah, some of our uh, services are long running tasks so then uh, we could enable the aot and this reduce further the uh, the startup time and then we also uh, leverage the observability improvements which i will talk uh, related to the distributed uh, tracing and then moving to java 21 it was a smooth ride basically we had to update uh, lombok and some of our uh, testing uh, libraries and that was it and similar for spring boot uh, 3.2 i'll mention um, the changes that we had to do between 3.2 and 3.2 but then let's look at the uh, migration challenges um, i'll have to mention that first we moved to 3.0 of course because we did the step uh, upgrades so we'll focus on the distributed uh, tracing on the resiliency uh, on the testing api documentation yeah jakarta packages again of course this you can uh, do it with the uh, open rewrite but i'll briefly mention it out of scope for this talk uh, talking about uh, spring security for this please check the amazing talk from uh, Daniel, but also check the amazing um, talk from last year from Laurentius Spilka. He talked on the um, Spring Security on Spring Boot uh, 3. And then, okay, let's look into the distributed um, tracing. 
I like to make the analogy of a relay race. So we have the athlete that is passing a stick or the baton to the next athlete and uh, so on and so forth. Basically, we have to pass a baggage from one service to another. And this is the so-called uh, tracing context. And then what did we have? On the Spring Boot 2.x, we had Spring Cloud Sloth, which is a tracing uh, layer built over Brave uh, tracing library. And therefore, the default observability format is B3. And then in Spring Boot 3, this was replaced with micrometer tracing. And Spring Cloud Sloth is no longer supported for uh, V3, to keep it simple. And micrometer tracing is a facade tracer library over Brave and open uh, telemetry. Again, for this, I would like you to watch the talk from uh, uh, Tommy and Jonathan. Uh, they went in depth. Um, about micrometer uh, tracing the uh, latest uh, release. But also important to mention the default propagation format for auto is W3C. So then uh, we encounter some issues here. Um, the join span, uh, they were no longer supported. The multiple context propagation types were uh, not supported as well. The logging pattern, it was not auto-configured anymore for the trace ID and span IDs. And this is a very important one. For the executor and executor task, we didn't have the observation out of the box. Again, I'm talking here as per Spring Boot uh, 3.0. Meanwhile, the story changed. I will, I will mention it. And then, OK. What uh, uh, now? Yeah, since I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a bouldering lover. You'll see here the pictures with the uh, bouldering and climbing. Um, and then we'll have to look at the solution. But first, let's understand the propagation format. So we have the B3, which can be in single or multi-header. And then this originated from Zipkin uh, project. And what's interesting here, the trace ID can be in 64-bit representation or 128-bit representation. And the span ID and parent ID are 64-bit representation. And then we have the W3C um, common format for propagating trace uh, context. This is getting popularity. So it consists of a trace parent header, which has the version, the trace ID, the parent ID, and the trace flags. But you can see there that the trace ID is represented as 128-bit. In our um, services, we used on B3 the trace ID on 64-bit. So then we'll have to decide on how to go uh, forward. Of course, additionally for the W3C, besides the trace parent, there is a trace state where you can pass additional flags in the form of key um, value pairs. I'm curious, um, is anyone uh, using B3 uh, propagation format in uh, production? Raise your hand. Or W3C? Oh, nice, nice. Or any other format? I know there is one, the one from, uh, from Google also, there's the X-Trace. OK. Um, then. Um, we had to um, move forward. And for our hero service under migration, we had to decide what do we want to do. We had this on Spring Boot 2, the B3 uh, read and write. And an easy solution would be, OK, also on Spring Boot 3, rely on the B3 propagation format. But then we wanted to take a step further and to also support W3C format, if this is the default for um, um, open telemetry. And then with the use of micrometer tracing plus open telemetry configuration, we could configure both W3C uh, format and uh, B3 propagation type. And what is uh, interesting here, if we look at uh, open um, uh, telemetry configuration and um, closer to, to micrometer, we can define a bin for the text map propagator where we can inject the B3 propagator. And then there is the method to inject the single header of the multi header. The multi header usually it's used for the services um, that are built with um, um, Java E. There it was the practice to use multi header for, um, for the B3. And then we had to define our custom bin. If B3 propagator is in the class path, then um, to um, use this method, inject single header, which will basically propagate it as a single header to the downstream service. But if we look at the implementation of it, actually we can read both um, um, single B3 and multi B3. So then for this service, um, um, it covers this. And if we look further at the implementation in micrometer tracing, they have a multi text map propagator where it will have this text map propagator plus the default one of uh, um, W3C with the open telemetry. So in this case, we 
we can have uh, both. Now, the interesting uh, uh, part is, okay, we configure it for both uh, uh, read and uh, uh, write. The W3C will take precedence over B3. So then if your, your service can support both uh, uh, B3 and W3C, the W3C value will be read. And that's interesting, because if we um, propagate the B3 single in 64-bit to um, um, a service that can uh, um, rely on W3C, then you can see that the generated trace ID is now 128-bit. This is what open telemetry supports, so we'll have the padded uh, zero in front. This is interesting if you want to see the life cycle of the request in the distributing tracing system that you use then yeah it will not show up if you search for the key value so then you actually have to search for the um, yeah, value of the of the trace id only but then this change with the spring boot 3.0.8 we can now nicely define the produce and consume uh, properties that are available in um, a micrometer tracing uh, and the default ordering for this is w3c b3 single and b3 multi so then we can uh, um, define multiple uh, propagation type which in our case was uh, was needed and then i will look further into the micrometer observations so we use the rest template the web client and the rest client and they are uh, automatically observed out of the box that's awesome they are aware of the micrometer observation api but then we had in our logic other processing tasks and we can look here at the event uh, listener schedule task async task runnables on purpose i strike a schedule task uh, from here because since spring boot 3.2 with the add schedule this is also instrumented for observability uh, out of the box so that's great and the schedule task uh, has the observation um, auto configured but then if we don't have it we have to um, enable the tracing by using the at observed and of course if we have in our class path the spring boot um, starter aop and basically the the observed aspect instance has to be uh, registered um, as a bin and what's also interesting since spring boot 3.2 you also heard today from um, tommy and jonathan all the micrometer annotations are auto configured as well if aspect j is available on the on the class path so then they are automatically registered in the observation config but there is still another way or how we can do it if we still cannot achieve the intended observation we can do it programmatically we can define our own um, observation um, we'll observe the intended logic then we have to define the um, cardinality for that uh, logic that we observed and of course um, add it to the observation um, uh, registry a class that i like very much and we use it uh, a lot is the test observation um, uh, registry so this class has access to all the observations in our service and basically we can do a search to see that um, our logics are observed properly and then we can check if it has started if there are errors if it has been stopped uh, uh, gracefully but further there is also the um, async instrumentation so i mentioned if we have runnables in our code the trace id is not propagated from the main thread to the uh, runnable thread so then here again we had to do our own um, custom um, bin definition um, first we need to use the wrap method for the context snapshot and then we have to register to capture the all the um, um, wrappers that we have um, uh, defined um, so then it's not a lot of logic but then we have to oh yeah then we have to uh, uh, capture um, this in a, in a custom bin that we define. And then also since, since Spring Boot 3.2, we have the logging auto configured. Um, that's very nice. So with the property logging.pattern.correlation, we, we can define how the trace ID and span ID is uh, looking. And then I will look further to the Apache HTTP client because we are using this. And with Spring Boot uh, V3, um, is not using any more um, uh, HTTP client uh, before. There are breaking changes, and we noticed in our regression an interesting uh, retry behavior clash. And of course, there are global package relocation, so then several imports to change. This can be done automatically. But then, okay, what to do now? Of course, the solution is to move to Apache HTTP client v5 since Spring Boot 3.x is built on top of Spring Boot uh, 6.0, uh, 
or of Spring 6.0, sorry, then um, the V5 uh, version has to be used. And um, we can follow the approach for the configuration, that's simple. But let's look into the breaking changes. So what we noticed that the read timeout was no longer taken into account. So for this, we had to define we had to define it as in the socket config class as part of the SO timeout um, uh, variable. This was interesting, similar for the connect timeout. Otherwise, the configurations that we had in our services were not um, taken into account. And then for the retry behavior. In our services, we use custom uh, retry and back of policies. And Apache HTTP client v5 automatically retries failed request based on the policy defined in the default HTTP request retry strategy. And if Spring retry is used, it will take control over the retry mechanism. And this will conflict with our configuration. Yes. OK. Um, then what did we have to do? We have to automatically um, disable the retry policy. Um, and this is from HTTP client builder. And in the REST template builder, we don't have an equivalent. So then we had to define our own HTTP client, and then, of course, um, set it um, in the REST template. Now, this one is easy. We can achieve it with um, open rewrite, but it's important. We have to move to the Jakarta namespace. And for Java 17 uh, um, only, yeah, you could still use the Java X, by the way. Uh, with since version of Spring Boot 2.5, you can still use um, um, Java 17. Um, um, so then, yeah, can be um, nicely used with, uh, or not nicely, but can be used with Java X as well. Next, I would like to look into the API documentation. We were using Swagger 2.0, which is not compatible with um, uh, Jakarta. So then we also had to do uh, a change here. This is, again, not the package allocation simply is not supported anymore. And in Swagger Library V2, support Jakarta, but um, they abandoned um, the Swagger 2.0 spec in favor of OpenAPI 3.0. And then what now? Of course, we had to move to OpenAPI 3.0 spec. So then we had to replace um, the Jersey 2 JaxRS library with the JaxRS 2 Jakarta library. OK, this is easy. But then we also had to change all the annotations to the open uh, API. Um, and this was quite some work. And as pro tips here, we were generating the open API spec at runtime. So then this can have a performance penalty on your service. And we took the opportunity to do the open API spec generation at build time, so during our CI CD um, pipeline. And also, we are um, now starting to use um, the contract first. So then defining the open API spec and then generate the boilerplate for the Severin client. So there are tools available out there. A known one maybe already played with is the open API um, uh, generator. So I will recommend you to try it out, to start from the spec and then generate the client and server because it will make uh, redundant the contract testing layer if you ensure that for uh, server version, you'll have the same uh, client version. By the way, um, if you want to go in depth about OpenAPI, please check uh, about their talk of last year. It was a very interesting one. And then um, we had for testing um, WireMock uh, dependency. We're using it in our uh, class path. And simply for version before um, 3.x, it was uh, depending on uh, um, Java 8, um, that's one. But then also for the version on 3.x, it is depending on JT 11. And Spring Boot 3 is depending on JT 12. So then um, what to do now? Uh, our recommended approach is to use the standalone version. So then you'll have the fat jar with the shady dependencies. And then you have the Wiremock version on 3.x. It will not interfere with your class path. But then if you still want to um, use the actual Wiremock artifact, then there is a new um, library released recently from Wiremock, the Wiremock JT12. And in this way, plus the Wiremock library, plus the Spring Boot 3, then it, uh, it can work. Further, um, we had changes in the graceful shutdown phases. In our services, we use custom smart um, uh, lifecycle. Why? Because the default 
um, graceful shutdown is 30 seconds. And depending on the task that we have, for example, the async one, in our case, may take longer than 30 seconds. So what we had to do, um, we had to um, update uh, those customer smart life cycle, considering now that the graceful shutdown begin phase is in uh, 2048, and then it stops in 1024. So it goes from the highest to lowest. So then if we want to have it uh, um, before the application uh, graceful shutdown, we have to, to set it uh, accordingly. And then we took also the opportunity to introduce more and more test containers. We are using it. But then it really helped with the regression for the integration test uh, to make more use of, uh, of uh, test, con test containers. I really recommend it. You already know about, um, yeah, we have the um, booth at the ground floor from uh, awesome team from test containers. It is using the real dependencies. In our case, what we use are the generic containers. We have our own custom images, um, and therefore we also have our own custom uh, configuration. But with Spring Boot 3, there is now uh, the known annotation at service connection, which can be used with the specific out-of-the-box container, with the Mongo container or yeah, with the Kafka container. Or if you want to use it with a generic uh, container, then you can uh, use it with the name property. And then yeah, you can use the at service connection with name Mongo, and then for the generic uh, container, which has um, a Mongo image. I recommend you the last year talk from Oleg, it was a very nice one on, uh, on test containers. So then, key takeaways. Uh, please do the step upgrades if you have to deal with the migration. So don't skip intermediate uh, versions. This is very important. And use latest um, versions of the third-party dependencies. Use the opportunity to upgrade to the third-party dependencies. Yeah, it's um, obvious and well-known, but it's good to repeat it. And check for the breaking changes up front. I'll recommend using OTL with W3C, and then, yeah, you'll have also next uh, to explore the whole OTL ecosystem. If you rely on the, on the OTL collector then further, and then how is your data propagated to the um, databases or where you store uh, the tracing or metrics uh, information. Use micrometer annotations with the aspect J. They are out of the box and strongly recommend to use uh, test containers and explore also looking at the API contract first. So then defining the open API spec and generating automatically the server and client code. And I'm approaching the end. In the top right corner, you can see there the QR code for the ASML software community. So that's external. If you want to join, uh, you can know more about ASML, uh, meetups, uh, tech talks that we have, and you'll um, find um, amazing uh, software enthusiasts um, that are very active there. And of course, in the middle, if you want to stay in uh, contact with me, you have the, my LinkedIn uh, QR code. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs> now, I'll, I know you are tired, so we can talk afterwards, uh, or if you have questions uh, now, that's also uh, fine for me. OK, let's make it uh, simple. Let's go to the closing. Yeah. OK, there is a question. OK, yeah. oh, sorry. OK, sorry. Uh, is this one? Yeah, I just have a. OK, yes. it's working now. OK, uh, I have a question. You mentioned you need high scalability. I must not, not understand the process, because if you're collecting data about uh, some manufacturing process, isn't that kind of predictable or? Predictable? I, I'll yeah. need more context. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, maybe I don't understand uh, what the ASML does or what they do, but uh, I guess you're testing the manufacturing process, like lithography, and you're collecting the data and whatnot measurements. Okay. Isn't, don't you kind of know the amount of data that you're going to receive in that process? Or uh, no, not getting short it? No? answer is no, but no. we can talk more uh, <laughs> okay. about afterwards. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah. I'll take you up on that. OK, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Let's conclude it here. I'll uh, talk with you afterwards. Thanks for joining again. <laughs>